Now, not only did he help the likes of Phil Milkelson, Dustin Johnson, Tiger Woods, I mean, the list goes on and on, Adam, Adam Scott, Fred Couples, uh, Justin Leonard, Mark Halkovecchia. What makes you so good? <laughs> I'm not going to tell anybody that, do you? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's because I was raised in a golf family. My father, uh, Claude Harmon, won the Masters in 1948. He was a great player, great teacher. I've, I'm 72 years old, so I've been around all the great champions way back into the Hogan and, and Nelson and Snead era. Uh, I just love watching my dad when he was with these great players and how he helped them. And uh, I think it helped me understand that at some point in time in my life, this is what I want to do. And then here we are. Yeah, so this is an interesting thing because I find this, uh, I'm, I'm always compelled and, and fascinated by people who grow up in sport households. You know, when their kids go on to become professional athletes, you know, is it something that is taught? Is it something that's inherited? Is it just instilled from a young age because it's basically life? I don't know. I think it's probably all of those things, to be honest with you. If you look at our family, uh, there's four boys. We all went into the same profession our father was in. We've all been very successful at it, yeah. which is very unusual because normally you may have one son in the family. If there's four of you go in that footsteps and everyone else would go the other direction. And the other three are accountants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just think we admired our dad so much. He was so good at what he did. Uh, it took me a little longer in life to, to really understand that this was what I wanted to do and, and understand. You know, it's really funny when, you're, when your father is a living legend and, and he's alive, you look at him. I tell people all the time when I get these parents bring their uh, young kids to, to me to help them, and the, the parent will say, you know, well, I, I'm his daddy. He doesn't listen to me. I say, well, I can get that. My father won the Masters. How smart was I? I didn't listen to him either. So, it's, <laughs> you know, it just is what it is. But I think... We just, the four of us, we got where we love the game. We've been in it our whole life. And it's really, I tell people all the time, if they ever made golf illegal, I'd be in trouble. I'd be robbing a 7-Eleven or something <laughs> to make a living. This is all I know how to do. I, I, I love people. I love to teach. I'm no different than a professor you had in college or your high school teacher or grade school teacher. It's, we get great satisfaction out of seeing not only the best players in the world, but the guys I was with yesterday out at the course. So we had a great time and just seeing them improve. So it's, it's the joy of teaching really more than anything. What, what do you love about golf? Like I love when people describe the things that they're most passionate about. What is it about the game? I think golf is, is probably the only sport in the world you can play your whole life. You can play as a youngster, you can play as, as a person that's older. It's an unusual sport in that you don't have any teammates. It's all you. Everything that happens, that little doggone white ball doesn't move till we move it, and it only goes in the direction we make it move it. So it's very challenging. Yeah. And I think that's why all great athletes love to play golf, because it's something they can't conquer. The other thing people don't talk about, which makes us so unique compared to other sports, is you can go right down on the same arena that you see the guys on TV playing on. You can go and stand on the 17th hole at TPC in Sawgrass and hit the ball on the green and say, gosh, I can't believe these guys hit it in the water every time when they come here. Yeah. So you can go on the arena. We can't go play baseball in Yankee Stadium or tennis at Wimbledon, but in golf, you can go to every one of the venues that you see on television. You can stand on those very tees and have the same experience, and I think it's pretty unique. Yeah. When you, when you were a kid, were watching your dad, and were you, were you going to all the tournaments with him? Were you traveling with him? Were I traveled just... a lot. My mother had, uh, there's six, uh, six children. My mom had 10 pregnancies, so it, Seems like their mom was always pregnant. So when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, I would go to all these tournaments with my father. And, and back in the, the, the 50s, they didn't even have ropes up. So everybody just walked down the fairway. You could be walking along with Ben Hogan, and you're just kind of talking to him. And he was a right. good friend of my dad. So I, I just took it for granted that's the way it was. Just but normal, it, just life. It was a life experience that it, I don't think until I was 40 years old till I actually realized how fortunate I was to have had the opportunity to see all those great players so up close and personal. Yeah, let's, you've been around the game a long time. How have you seen it change? Like from, you know, just as you were saying, there used to be ropes up on the course. Like what has really changed about the game? I mean, the money I'm sure is vastly different these days. Well, there's no doubt about that. When my father won the Masters in 1948, he won $2,500. I mean, right. he really couldn't make much money playing <laughs> golf in those days. Uh, so I think the thing that has changed the most in probably the last 10 years has been equipment. Yeah. Equipment has gotten so much better. The golf balls travel straighter and further. For the tour players, you and I don't get the advantage of that because we don't have the club head speed to take advantage of it. The athlete that we get is a much bigger, stronger athlete than we've ever had before. If you go to the Hall of Fame and you look at 
guys who a lot of you grew up idolizing. If you look at a Ben Hogan, he was about five foot eight. Lee Trevino was about five foot seven. Gary Player was about five eight. Jack Nicholas was about five ten, five nine and a half. Now you look at all the players, and they're six one, six two, six three, yeah. six four. Real good athletes. And what we've found in my academies around the world especially in the U.S., is the kids that used to play football, basketball, and baseball are now playing golf at a young age, and they're not playing the other sports, so we get a more fine-tuned athlete. In a way, I don't think that's good. I think playing other sports for your hand-eye coordination is very good, but we seem to see in this day and age, like you said, with all the money that's in the game, that parents tend to push their kids every now and then. And the longevity of the game. You just play golf, and you can play it forever, and so we're getting a better athlete to work with than we ever have before. Let's talk about Let's talk about kind of the difference between that athlete. Like, what's the difference between the guy who kind of gets into the pro circuit or the guy who's on the amateur circuit that's on the fringe but hasn't quite broken through? Like, what's the difference in their game and their skill? It's light years apart, yeah. to be honest with you. The best players in the world are so much better than the guys at your club that you think are really good players. And once it gets to the upper echelon level, the greatest players in the world and then the guys that are really good the difference there is mo mostly mental. It's yeah. more confidence because they're all pretty good. When you look at the amateur ones, the best players in the amateur level, they've got a long ways to go to get to compete with the guys that do it for a living. I think one of the joys that I get is watching the best players in the world under the extreme pressure of having a chance to say win the US Open or the Masters, the phenomenal golf shots that they hit under yeah. all this pressure. And everyone thinks about, well, it's all about the money and they all make millions of dollars. Golf is a unique sport. Unlike any other sport, unlike baseball or football or basketball, you only get paid if you perform well. The other sports, you could pay a, a right fielder a 15 million a year and he hits 210 the next year, he still gets his 15 million. In golf, if you don't play good, you don't get paid. Yeah. And then going back to your question, I think the amateur ranks, the players uh, just have to learn so much more about themselves and how to compete and how to handle the pressure of competition. And that becomes the biggest challenge. And how hard is it to make that jump? Like when you're, it's almost like if you look at all the players who play high school football that then to that amount that go to college to then that amount that go to pros. I mean, the funnel gets super thin. Well, of course it does. And you, you have all these parents today that they see the superstars making all this money and they'll, they'll bring me, I'll give you an example of a, a, a father a couple of years ago brought me his 16-year-old son, and he says, my son is really, really good. I want you to, to help him and, and take him to the next level. And I said, okay. So he, I started talking to this young man, what do you shoot at your own course? He goes, oh. And then his father would answer every time. He wouldn't let the poor kid talk. And the father would say, oh, you know, he shoots right around par or better every time. I said, well, then he's got no chance. And the father looked at me like, what are you talking about? I said, look, if, you, if your son is as good as you think he is, if he's not shooting 65, 6, or 7 on his own course every day where he knows every club to hit, every, how every putt breaks, he knows every hole, then he's not quite as good as you say he is, but let's, let him answer the questions for me. Yeah. And the young man said, thank you. He goes, yeah, I, I do this and I do that. I watched him hit balls, and uh, he was a very nice young man. The father was a little overbearing. Yeah. And he kept telling me, see, he's great, isn't he? He's great, isn't he? And finally, I, I said to the father, could you come over here for a minute, because I didn't want the young man to hear this. I put my arm around the, the father, and I said, you need to understand, I've seen greatness. This isn't it. Yeah. OK? <laughs> this, is, this is a 16-year-old young, young man that someday may pan out to be something. But One day, got, he'll be a great caddy. you got to quit putting his yeah. great in his head. Yeah. And then finally I said to the guy, why don't you go down and have some lunch? Oh, no, I need to stay and, and watch you teach. And he said, no, no, just do me a favor. Why don't you just go get it? So he walked away. And this is the sad thing with some parents that are overbearing. The young man said, oh, thank you, Mr. Harmon. It's so much nicer when my dad's not here. And that's sad. Yeah, that's tough. So let's, let's talk about parenting and the idea of sports, because this is, this is a big one. And especially as you hear about you know, all the injuries, we've had five high school football players this year die from head injuries during games. Um, people who want to get their kids into sports, they're, you know, and they're saying golf, that's what, I'm going to get my kid into that. As a parent, when should you push your kids towards a sport? How do you want to naturally migrate them into this process? And as a coach, I'm sure this is something you deal with all the time from overbearing parents to parents who, whose kids could have athletic ability. I don't think you should ever push them. I yeah. think it should be their idea. If, if your son shows an interest when you go to the driving range to hit balls and he wants to go with you, good, let him go. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks in our family, because all four of the Harmon boys became very successful golf professionals, that our father pushed us. That wasn't it at all. He allowed us to play other sports and do whatever we wanted to do. 
And I think if you have a son or a daughter that shows an interest in, in, because you're going to play golf and he goes and he enjoys it, well, then that's a good thing. Let him come along at a young age and let him learn, get him some lessons, teach him how to hold a golf club, explain to him a little bit about hitting the ball. And then if he continues to show some interest and shows a little form, then you can get him some lessons and stuff. But I don't think you want to push him. Yeah. Because if you push them, then I think they will sometimes rebel against you and turn away. Yeah. And, so, and then they just won't want to play anything. No, then they don't want to do what you do. Yeah, you know, screw you, Dad. It, then they drive off in the car. Because it's your idea. Yeah, you know how right. that goes, yeah. So let's um, talk about your early playing days back when you used to play. And I, I imagine that you were probably a bit of perfectionist as well, having watched the instructional videos I've seen of yours. How hard of you were you on yourself? I, uh, I was ridiculous on myself. Yeah. I, uh, I, had, uh, I was such a perfectionist that if I didn't hit the shot perfectly, I didn't like it. Uh, I would whine and complain, you know, I'd hit a good shot and say, I hit it on the toe or nah, I hit it on the heel. And I was playing with this guy when I was in the Army, Master Sergeant. And we were playing for a little money, and he said to me one day, you know, you complain on every shot. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. He says, you know, you'll say, oh, I hit it on the toe, I hit it on the hole, on the heel. He says, let me give you a good piece of advice, young man. He says, 50% of the people you're playing with don't give a damn how you're hitting it. The other 50% wish you were playing worse, so you just need to shut up. Yeah. You, just, you, <laughs> you just need to try and play golf. But I, I watched my dad, how good he was, and, and how I always wanted to be that good, and I never could quite get there. Yeah. And I think I kept myself from being a good player because of my temperament. I'll tell you a story on myself. I was about 17 years old, and I was winning all these junior tournaments in the metropolitan area in New York where we grew up. I went and played in a tournament. And my idol was Arnold Palmer. I mean, I hitched my pants up like Arnie did and had this little goofy follow through like Arnold did. And I, I just tried to be Arnold Palmer. And I got mad in this junior tournament, broke my driver. So I come home, and I already know the pro has called my father and told him what a jerk his son was today. He got mad and broke his driver. So I walk in the house, and my dad's sitting in his chair. He's always sitting. He goes, so how'd you play today, Butch? Now I know he knows that I didn't play very good. I said, I didn't play very good, Dad. I shot 79. I just, he says, you know, I don't know why you get so mad. You've never been any good. <laughs> and, I, and I said, excuse me? He goes, you've never been any good. You're Butch Harmon. You're nothing. Now, if you were Arnold Palmer, he's good. He can get mad. <laughs> He, he has a right to get mad. You have no right to get mad. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right, but I didn't like hearing it. But he, yeah. he was right. <laughs> uh, just to show you can see how not good he is, let's just watch a little clip of a video that we shot as we were looking to take some footage. This is, I believe, was this yesterday? Oh, the stuff we did out the course was... Where is that? The... We're bringing it up. Here we go. I was hitting a shot on the uh, sixth hole of part three out of True North. And the photographer, Robert Evans, said, can I get down below you and, and take a picture? It was right before one of the groups came up I was going to hit a shot with. And I said, sure. It was 160 yards. It was a little downhill, so it was only playing about 145. So I hit an eight iron, and that's, that's the swing. And uh, it went in, hole in one. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the interesting thing was, you know, when you, you make a hole in one, you're supposed to make it during the course of a round, and you play the whole round. And, <laughs> So I've, I've made seven hole-in-ones previous to that. Well, the hell with that rule. That's my eighth. I'm counting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk about some of the people you played with. Or let's, let's, before we do that, let's talk about, as you, were, as you were saying, the transition from kind of playing to coaching. Because this is one of those things that a lot of people can't do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, because you have to be a very, I think, specific person who understands the game. Uh, you have to be, a, I think, a, a wise enough person to be able to explain that to someone else and smart enough to be able to see the mechanics of what's not working. So let's just first talk about the transition you made to coaching and why. Well, as a kid playing junior golf, because I was hanging around my dad all the time, I watched him teach. And so I always would help the guys I was playing with or think I was helping them, you know. And, yeah. and I, my deal was I was going to play the tour. I played 69, 70, 71 until my oldest child, my daughter, Michael, was old enough to go to school. And if I wasn't making enough money at that point in time, then I would go into club. So I did a great thing for the PJ Tour in 1971. I left it, got <laughs> off of it, and went into teaching. I've always had, and I can't explain why, I've always had an eye that I see things, I think, differently than, than a lot of instructors do. I, I can't tell you why. When I see a golf swing, I see about 60 or 70 things at one time. You know, yeah. grip stance, posture, ball position, plane swing, arms, hands, everything. And it just, it's like a, a computer. It just goes off and then something will jump out at me. The big, what I call the cancer in your swing will jump out at me and I'll see it and then I'll talk to the people about it and we'll work on it that way. And, and like anything else, I mean, I've been a golf pro for 50 years. It's like anything else, the more you do it, the better you get at it. The better you get at it, the more you want to learn. And this is something all of you sitting out here 
today. I, I never stop learning. My dad had a saying that I think is so true in life and in, in my profession. It's, after, it's what you learn after you think you know it all will probably be the most important things you learn in life. And so for me, even though I've taught this for 50 years, I've had tremendous success at it, I'm always learning. I saw a guy, I'm not going to say the gentleman's name or tell you who he was because he might be sitting here that had a very strange swing yesterday. And on this same tee... He made one of these weird golf swings that the club got in the worst position I've ever seen at the top. He got back down, he hit it and went right on the green and a light went off in my head. I said, wow, that guy was in a position, there's no way he could get that club back to the ball and the ball, club on the ball squarely, but he did. And I put that in my memory bank because somewhere down the road, I'm gonna see a guy gets in that position that can't get the club square at impact and I've seen somebody do it and I remember how he did it and I can use that as a little teaching. So there's all kinds of little tricks like that. But I just like to teach. I mean, I like people. I like being around people. This is a fascinating honor for me to be here with you people today. I was in watching this morning's sessions. I watched this afternoon's sessions. It's just fascinating to listen to these people talk. So I use Google all the time, Google Maps, Google Search every day. I mean, heck, I'm sitting here at a Google thing, and I use you guys all the time. It's pretty cool. Who's the, uh, who is the best player you've ever coached? I think the player that had the most ability was Tiger Woods. The 10 years I had with Tiger Woods from 93 to 02 were pretty special. Yeah, he won eight Grand Slams during he that time. He won eight majors. He won three U.S. amateurs. He won a zillion tournaments. Uh, I think, I'll tell you an interesting story about Tiger Woods. In 1993, uh, Greg Norman had won the British Open, and, and Greg gave me a lot of credit for, for winning that. And his, Tiger was playing in a U.S. amateur tournament in Houston, Texas, where I, I live in he brought Tiger over for me to see him. I'd never seen him before. I mean, I knew who he was, but I'd never seen him. So yeah. he's hitting balls, and you could see this. I mean, he, he, he was only like 16 in those days. He had this tremendous natural ability. So I said to this kid, he's on the tee, I said, Tiger, when you get on a tight hole, every good player has a stock shot they go to if they have to get the ball in, in the fairway. And I said, so what is your stock shot when you have to get in the fairway? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I just hit it as hard as I can. Wherever the heck it goes, I go find it, and I hit it again. <laughs> So I'm thinking to myself, well, this is a cocky little SOB here that I'm dealing with. And the more I got to know him, that was how he played. He just yeah. teed it up, let it fly, and he says, I'm sending it, and wherever it goes, I'm going to go find it and hit it again. So you could see this raw talent that was unpolished. And as we went through the whole process of working through his, the end of his high school, a couple years at Stanford, and then on as a, as a, as a tour player, and then becoming, the, in my opinion, the greatest player I've ever seen play. Jack Nichols is the greatest champion. Tiger's the best I've ever seen. Yeah. He probably had more natural ability than anyone else, but he also had the smarts. He, was, he, he had learned at a young age how to use his head and how to, how to compete. I think the, the one that I probably have the most fun with is Phil Mickelson. Yeah. Because, you know, the, the, the question all the time with Phil for you golfers is what the heck will Phil do next? Because he's liable to hit it anywhere and do all this stuff. <laughs> but Phil loves to give you a lot of smack talk, and he likes to talk, and he likes to needle guys and stuff. And so I've had a great time with uh, my eight or so years with Mickelson. He's fun to be around. And then now Ricky Fowler, Ricky at 26 years old, uh, He's got me at 72 calling people dude. So you, know, you can see the inflection on that. I was giving a lesson to the other guy. I said, no, dude, you, he said, dude, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so, so Ricky is so much fun. And, uh, he keeps trying to get me to wear those goofy hats he's wearing, but I'm not putting one of those on. <laughs> Tell me the story about the, uh, the golfer whose uh, mom was going to take him to the range. You heard a young man, Joseph Kim, a little while ago. Fascinating story. I mean, I had dinner with him last night. I sat at the same table with him. He's just such a wonderful young man. What you don't know, before he came out here, I saw him earlier today, we were in talking to him, and he was so nervous before he came out here. And I just put my arm around him and said, man, you're gonna do fine. You're talking about your own life. You know, you know how to do it. So he told me a story. He said, my foster mom said to me a few years ago that I wanna take you to the driving range. And he thought he was going to drive a car. And so he said they went to this range and he, he walked in and he saw these nets down the side and these people swinging these clubs and hitting these balls. And he said to his foster mom, where are the cars? <laughs> and she goes, no, this is the golf driving range. And he said he went up and tried it. And we were talking out there a little while ago and he said now he's obsessed with it. He says, this game is so hard, I want to learn how to do it. And I, I told him, I'm going to send you my email. If you're ever my way, you come see me. You can have all the free lessons you want because that story was compelling. Let's hear from Butch Harmon, everybody. Thank you.